Should we start? Okay. Welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds, everyone. Um, these three weeks, we have a very special edition of Grand Rounds featuring the six Barnes Medicine Chief Residents. Today, I have the great honor of introducing two of my co-chiefs and friends, Dr. Devin Cash and Dr. John Hickman. Um, both speakers today share a common origin story, having grown up in Lynchburg, Virginia, of all places. Um, I'm sure they brag about you two all the time back there. So, <laughs> first, we'll be hearing from Devin Cash, MD, PhD. He earned his BS in biochemistry at the University of Virginia for his undergraduate studies. He then stayed nearby to complete his PhD in immunology and MD at Virginia Commonwealth University. Next year, he will be working as a hospitalist at the VA with his time split between general inpatient medicine, teaching services, and the ICU. And then next, we'll learn more about Dr. John Hickman's fascinating background in theater and connections to his current career in medicine. John got his BS in communications at Northwestern University after the Chicago fire, <laughs> and then ventured home to the University of Virginia for his MD. Next year, he'll be going back to Virginia for GI fellowship. So... We'll start off with Devin and the benefits of geographic inpatient care. Thank you for that kind introduction. I'm glad that she did not reference my age, only John's. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is once again a privilege to stand in the pulpit and evangelize about the benefits of geographic care as we <laughs> move five days away from implementing it here at Barnes. Look forward to sharing some insights as to why we're making this change and hopefully you walk away with some understanding of how it will benefit our patients and our service. As the first slide, neither of us, unfortunately, have financial disclosures. <clears throat> so let's start first by taking a look back in time. So when I was an intern four years ago, all the medicine services existed in these three buildings. And by three, I mean Rand Johnson stuck in between Queenie and the Pavilion building. When we were interns, all of our patients for all three firms, that's Med 1, 2, and CARDS, were uh, localized predominantly to the 100 and 200 units of the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th floors. And there would be some overflow from time to time onto adjacent floors that still provided similar services, including the crew floor in 8100 would take CARDS overflow. Hospitalists technically own 10 and 14, and occasionally there would be rare um, overflows onto those units. But we had a somewhat homeostasis of how our service worked. Then, I believe in 2018, the site when cancer tower was completed, all the oncology services from Schaumburg moved into the tower, and then Schaumburg had some empty space, which freed up the hospital platform to think about ways that we could change our structure and, and uh, construct new buildings. So then we decided to de decommission Queenie Tower to replace it with something newer and uh, more modern. And in the process of doing so, a couple of key decisions were made. The first was that we would move some medicine service to North Campus because there weren't enough beds left on South. And in doing so, we chose to put all the hospitals, all those make all those beds hospitalists and keep all the firms on south. The challenge, though, is that there weren't enough floors left for us to easily overflow onto light floors. So our patients would often overflow on surgical platforms or other um, services that we're not as familiar with the kinds of patients we take care of. And then we end up in a situation like I was on one week ago where I had patients across 10 different units in the hospital that I would see on a daily basis. And that's kind of where we are now is that. We lost Queenie, we've got all these other fantastic buildings, but in the process of losing Queenie and then COVID happening, any ability to centralize where our patients were cared for was immediately lost as we had to use negative pressure spaces for COVID patients. And then in order to offload the ED, we just had to kind of shuttle patients into the hospital where we could find a bed when it went opened up. So over the course of the last 10 years or so, talking to some of the more veteran members of our department, it seems that the department has chosen to make small changes either to the caps of the services, the night flow distribution of patients or other things to try to make the system work despite the ongoing changes and the complexity of our patients getting higher and higher every year. But it seems like we haven't quite thought about how can we redesign the system for the future to be more sustainable um, and provide better quality care to our patients. So that gets us to where we are today, thinking about what is that redesign and why are we doing it the way we're doing it? So it's first worth mentioning that everything that we do on the floor doesn't happen in isolation. Our colleagues in the emergency room are often affected by the choices that we make on how we do our workflow. And so it's important to prioritize what they value as well as what we value to find a system that will be sustainable. The things that the emergency department seems to care the most about from my understanding are ED boarding times, which 
we can talk about in a second. And then just total throughput because they're always full and we need to give them the opportunity to take care of patients uh, that, that need care. So thinking about the boarding times in the old system, when firm is all on south and hospitals were on north, often a patient would be admitted by firm, but there would be no beds on south. There would be beds open on north and the patient could board 24 to 36 hours in the ED waiting for a bed. Now that doesn't lead to great quality care because the ED doesn't really have the ability to supervise those patients in the same way they would get on the medicine services. And then it kind of locks up the bed flow downstairs, creating a disequilibrium between firm patients taking forever to get to the floor and hospitalist patients moving quickly to the North Campus, but only after the firm was paged out first or filled first. And so we had to incorporate their goals into our goals to make sure that the system would work. So we'll start first by looking at some data that was collected about five years ago by O'Leary and colleagues, including Mark Williams, our chief of hospital medicine, looking at <clears throat> a variety of variables at teaching programs across the country. So there were 94 program directors from internal medicine who responded to questions like, on average, what number of units do your physicians work on per day? What percentage of the physicians work in more than one building? Is there a nurse physician co-leadership in inpatient units? Is there protected time for that kind of leadership? How often do, do interdisciplinary rounds happen? And if so, how often? And so just looking at the top white box, I don't know if my mouse is visible, it is not. Um, greater than seven is the highest number of units that they surveyed, and it was only 6% of respondents. But as mentioned previously, I was working on 10 units last week. So clearly we have a system that's outside of the norm for what teaching programs do, which is why we're motivated to get back to a better place. It is worth noting, however, that we do do interdisciplinary rounds or DCAM as we call it now, but it will be called something new very shortly. Um, and it is unclear, at least to many, if there is true nurse physician co-leadership with the inpatient units. So a couple of goals in thinking about the redesign and the data that drive it. Oh, oh sad it didn't format correctly. Um, the first is to improve communication across clinical teams uh, and the members of those teams, to improve work efficiency by the primary service, to improve staff and patient satisfaction, which the next bullet should have, shed, should have said, improving nurse retention, improving clinical outcomes like length of stay and decreases in medical errors and patient safety, improving a learning environment and improving wellness along the way. So we'll spend the most time talking about communication because I think it's the area where the largest gains are made. O'Leary and colleagues in a separate paper, you'll hear, you'll hear that name a lot, um, looked at the challenges that medicine services face in their microsystem environments to imp improve communication, including that nursing and physician leadership often operate in silos or that physician leadership may not exist at all. Physicians being dispersed across multiple units makes it difficult for them to connect with unit leadership and get to know the nursing staff. Patients often have poor comprehensions of their plan of care because of the sort of intermixed uh, roles of the team members and where they operate in the hospital. And then few opportunities for team members exist to share and collaborate to make better decisions and care plans. And so what's interesting is when people study communication on care teams, they often ask the physicians their perspective and they will sometimes ask patients, but rarely do they ask nurses. And so the data on the right is actually fairly old. It's from 2004. And the two graphs represent teaching services on the left and hospital services on the right. And you used a five point Likert scale from basically bad to good, asking what is the quality of communication on your service? And if you look at the physician bars, both of them rate about a 70%. They thought they were doing a pretty good job. But if you ask the nurses on the same units how they thought the quality of communication was, they reported it closer to 40%, suggesting there was a substantial room for improvement. And this discrepancy in views often leads to nurses feeling like they're not true members of the care team. They don't feel like they belong, they're not as happy, they're not as fulfilled, that creates challenges for the care team. So O'Leary and colleagues yet again at Northwestern looked at um, how nurses rated the climates of teamwork and safety before and after the implementation of structured interdisciplinary rounds. So on the left column, you'll see that in the control units, both climates were rated about 60%, but after the implementation of structured inter interdisciplinary rounds, um, where the bedside nurses were actually included in those rounds, not just the nurse manager, that the safety climate went up by 25% and the teamwork climate went up by 15%. The formatting, okay. Um, 
So looking at, eventually Northwestern did localize their inpatient units. And looking at the data afterwards, they showed that communication between nurse and physician staff increased by approximately 15 to 20%, suggesting that contact was happening more, communication was flowing. And in the end, nurses and physicians agreed more closely that about several aspects of the care plan, including the plan tests that were uh, pending and the anticipated length of stay. So moving on to efficiency, on the right, you'll see a theoretical model for the way that inpatient localization could have both advantages and disadvantages. The boxes on the left are favorable and the boxes, the blue boxes and the gray boxes on the right are potential barriers to improved efficiency. So we'll walk through this very briefly, but as you localize, you're walking around less, you're waiting for elevators less. And here, I think everybody knows that that is a substantial amount of time. And so if you decrease wasted time, you increase efficiency, timeliness, safety. You're available to your patients more often when you're one room away. As the, as the teamwork on the unit increases, safety and effectiveness also increase. And that's partly related to communication, both directly uh, with patients on rounds and also unstructured communication through nursing other elements of the care team. And those are all considered to improve the quality of care. On the right, you can see there are a couple of detractors. Perverse incentives is a very kind way of them getting at the idea of playing the game with the drip system. If you know that every discharge means a new admissions coming your way, sometimes people will delay discharge to later in the day so that the night float team picks it up or they won't do as many in one day because it can become overwhelming. So um, those incentives can ultimately lead to decreased efficiency because those decisions aren't best for patient care, they're best for workflow for the physician. Increased interruptions was observed in numerous studies as well as the theoretical model. And by that, I mean that when the physicians are more available to the nurses on the unit, the nurses will frequently check in about questions they may have waited to ask when they saw the physician next. But if you're there and close by, they'll pop in and ask you. And if the frequency of those questions gets to a certain point, it starts to decrease your efficiency as you try to document all your notes for the day, et cetera. Increased variability in patient flow refers to sort of the basal bolus nature of inpatient care. Some days there's a bunch of discharges in the units and those days, the nurses find it really challenging to manage three discharges while also taking care of the patients that remain on the unit. And likewise, admissions will do the same thing probably the next night shift. And then a mismatch in team specialty. So that refers to patients who end up on a service that's not familiar with it, medical conditions that they have. For example, a medicine patient ending up on a surgical ward or a cardiac patient ending up on med firm or a med firm patient ending up on cardiology. When the nurses are best attuned to the issues that they know they're looking for, they're gonna provide better care and alert the physician sooner of any decompensation. Now, thinking about those four boxes, We've made some efforts in our own model to improve each of those by changing the incentive structure slightly to where not every discharge will result in your own team admitting. The increase in interruptions will have to be monitored, but hopefully Epic Chat will moderate some of the pop-in face-to-face communications. Variability in patient flow is difficult to mitigate. In mismatch in team specialty, we got rid of the cards firm that had a medicine attending, which will hopefully undo some of that. And we're going to localize cardiology patients to cardiology floors and medicine patients to medicine floors, hopefully, um, preventing that from becoming a safety issue. Thinking about staff satisfaction, <clears throat> there are a bunch of studies that look at this. Um, in general, geographic cohorting increases nursing satisfaction, probably for the reasons mentioned previously about being included in the care team. And when nurse physician relationships and teamwork climate improve, nurse retention improves. Mark Williams even highlighted this point when he was at Kentucky, they implemented localized wards, the nursing staff retention improved, and for unfortunate reasons we don't have time to go into, eventually they had to deconstruct their localized wards. And after that change, the nursing retention got worse again. Numerous studies report staff feel that they provide better, more patient focused and centered care in localized care models, which is always a good thing. This data, which was borrowed from a recent grant rounds that Reed Pierce gave, who he borrowed this data from Mike Leonard, who does safe and reliable healthcare, which is a consulting firm that uses internal scoring metrics to look at teamwork climate across various hospitals, designed this model where they looked at a hospital, which is blinded here in terms of where it actually was, but the data remains about teamwork climate. Now their goal was once you fall below scores of about 60%, outcomes start to get worse. So looking in the green boxes or the bars and boxes on the right, the ICUs, which are sort of intuitively more collaborative environments because of the acuity of care had the highest scores. And when you look down below, they also had the best outcomes in terms of employee satisfaction, which is substantially higher reduction in employee injuries per 1,000 days, reduction in absenteeism of employees, and reduction in vacancy rates of nursing positions. 
So if we can improve the climate of teamwork on units, hopefully we can show that those metrics will follow. In terms of patient experience, the data here often comes from places that use um, bedside interdisciplinary rounds. And by that, I mean on morning rounds, the case manager, the nurse, the social worker, sometimes a pharmacist, a nutritionist, and a physical therapist are all present. Everyone goes through an algorithm where they talk about their particular part of the care plan. The patient is given an opportunity to ask questions. And I directly quote this sentence from one of the papers from O'Leary. Findings suggest that when patients feel they're given the opportunity to ask questions, speak without being interrupted, and have their questions answered, they tend to be more satisfied with the experience of their care. Now, this should become a no-brainer, but I think we all know that sometimes we don't feel we have the time where patients talk too long, we, don't, we can't stay on rounds for 15, 20 minutes in every room, and we don't always make it back every day to talk to them to answer those questions, or we defer them to the nurse or the consultant. So increasing communication, even by just localizing the primary team, will still hopefully gain some of these outcomes, even if we don't do a full structured interdisciplinary rounds at the bedside every day but that could be a future direction. Yale did a study looking at a pre-post localization of their hospital wards, and they asked patients, do you know the primary diagnosis for which you're in the hospital? And prior to localization, patients could get the answer right 57% of the time. But after localization, they got it right 80% of the time, which kind of implies indirectly that communication, time spent at the bedside, all those things are improved when people have the time to be nearby and answer the questions. Next, we'll pivot to length of stay. This is data from Brown, uh, which I highlight because Brown was one of the models that we used to try to um, build our model here. So they went geographic in about 2013, and uh, they did a pre-post assessment of length of stay on their wards. Um, and it's worth noting that their teaching services um, did localize, but their non-teaching services did not. And so that can, it's not a perfect case control because teaching services are different a little bit, but it gives us some comparator. And the um, y-axis here is looking at observed versus expected length of stay. So the blue dumbbell shapes in each box represent the length of stay prior to localization. And the, and the blue line running across the um, chart represents the average. And you can see that you would expect observing um, expected length of stay to be the same. It would be the gray white line, gray line in the middle next to one. So prior to localization, they were observing that length of stay was always higher than expected. But after they localized and looking sort of years into the future, they found that length of stay became lower than expected for most patients, suggesting that um, being nearby was in fact a decrease in length of stay for their inpatient services. And this is important to highlight that it is a T-service. Another study, which I find really interesting, was done at Mayo Jacksonville. I believe it's probably the study I read that was closest to what we're doing here. And so they um, did two things simultaneously. There were studies that looked at implementing structured interdisciplinary rounds, there were studies that looked at localization, but there weren't a lot of studies that looked at doing both. And so they implemented uh, both at the same time because they had a five uh, floor hospital, medicine patients were shuttled across all five floors, but then they realized there wasn't enough capacity for medicine patients. So they opened up a dedicated unit just for medicine. And they used that as their sort of control or their case group for how can we localize and improve outcomes compared to the, what the standard practice was. So these patients are referred to as GAGL or uh, goal-directed achievement through geographic localization. And in that study, they found that by doing geographic localization, that they decreased the average length of, length of stay by 0.7 days per encounter with a p-value of 0.001, and they decreased adverse risk events by 3%, medication error, safety errors, those sorts of things, also statistically significant. And when they did a later financial analysis, they looked at how much money they saved by losing 0.7 length of uh, stay per encounter. And they estimated that it was about $2,400 per encounter or $2.4 million per thousand. And Mayo Jacksonville does about 3,000 um, medicine emissions per year. So we're talking close to $8 million in savings if um, those numbers pan out. And it's worth noting that here, their structured interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary rounds was only 15 minutes. So it's not like they were adding a ton of time to the day to achieve these outcomes. They were basically doing what we do in DCAM if DCAM were only once, which it will be soon. <laughs> in general, thinking about medical complications and errors, communication is the most frequent cause of medical errors. And in units with higher team cohesion, errors are less frequent. Looking at more data from the safe and reliable healthcare, same units, same teamwork climate, but this time the data at the bottom are looking at other outcomes. So HCAPS is a patient satisfaction score, which you can see is higher in better teamwork environments. But then looking at medication errors per month, much lower. Days between CDS infections, much more um, 
spread out and days between stage three pressure, ulcer, pressure ulcers are also less common. So um, those metrics also improve in this environment. Now, there are some limitations to some of the data that we've gone over here. Some of these studies use the structured interdisciplinary bed sound rounding that we're not planning to do right away. But I think there's still some insights that can be gleaned from those studies. Some studies are focusing on hospitalist units, which are fundamentally a little different than teaching teams and may not be generalizable in every, in every way. There are some discrepancies across studies where length of stay isn't always shown to be improved in some, but is improved in others. I tried to present data that most accurately reflected what we're planning to do here in hopes that it inspires people that it will be a positive benefit. It's not clear what the optimal patient volume is per team. All these studies talk about how they made one change. They went geographic, they introduced cyber or whatever they call it. Um, and the one study looked at both, but they don't talk about volume very often. Hospitalists were usually managing about 10 patients in these studies. I'm talking to Mark Williams, who's a bit of an expert because O'Leary was one of his colleagues. Um, what he said was that when you localize, you have so much safe time, you can take care of one to two more patients per day. But the problem seems to be in some of these studies that as you increase the workload because of the efficiency gains, all the benefits start to erode. And so there is some uh, magic number that is yet to be clarified about what patient volume can be uh, managed and still achieve increased uh, outcomes. And it's worth noting that in several studies, geographic wards do not reduce 30-day readmissions. So I want to pivot a little bit and think now, hopefully I've convinced you there's some advantages to doing it this way. And I think there's some intuitive advantages that may not have been explained here. But this is an extremely complex chart uh, published in the National Academy of Medicine about the systemic factors affecting well-being and resilience in the workplace. Now, we can't affect all seven of these of this change, but I circled the two on the left that I think may be impacted organizational factors, and learning and practice environment. So in terms of our learning environment, the work environment will have increased collaboration, which you couldn't read on the past slide, but was one of the uh, positive benefits. So it's sort of collaborative versus competitive environments. So hopefully as we work with the nurses and not against them, we'll find that um, the work environment becomes more pleasant. In terms of physical workspace, it's gonna be closer to the patients. In our model here, it'll have more space in computers than before. So you won't be running around spending time looking for a workstation there should be enough space on your unit to take care of your patients. As we alluded to previously, patient-centered focus comes into um, better clarity as everyone's working together as a team and spends less time chasing each other down and more time focusing on the patient, spending time at bedside, talking face-to-face. -face. And then as efficiency is increased, and it's hard to pin down exactly how to measure that, I actually asked um, Dr. O'Leary at Chicago if he had data on that, and he did not. Um, but as others have said, if you have time to take care of more patients, but we don't increase the census for the firms, will that lead to more time to attend conference? Thank you for those who came and those who are listening. <laughs> and also more informal teaching on rounds or at the bedside later, if you have an interesting exam, get back to some of the things we do with med students. Can we do those with residents too? Will we see changes in our evaluations as these metrics or these um, projects get implemented? Could this affect burnout? I sure hope so. Several studies report physicians spend more time at the bedside when their patients are localized. And one study specifically said that the number of pages per intern per hour decreased from 2.2 in the geographic, well, from 3.9 in standard care model to 2.2 in the geographic model. Now, that's not to say that communication diminishes. I spent the whole half of my first half of my talk talking about how communication will increase with this. But the hope is that because we're spending less time talking on the phone, talking in epic chat, we're spending more time face to face, either with talking to the nurse, talking to the patient, or doing both simultaneously. And my hope is that with increased face-to-face -face contact time and less time sitting in front of a computer, or at least no more time sitting in front of a computer, but more time with the patient, that that may mitigate some of the signs and symptoms of burnout, but that is yet to be determined. A few future directions at Barnes. Can we pair nurse and physician teams? There was another paper that was really interesting talking about whether we should, the, the next step of localization is to actually have one nurse cover one team. So one nurse for MedSU Blue Stripe, they cover all their patients. Could we have integrated nursing bedside rounds? I think that's achievable, especially if we do the first thing. And it's even interesting that in some of those studies, they found that primarily nursing assignments are based on workload. If someone's a total assist, you can't have five of those. It's too much work. So they try to spread them out. But in the studies where they didn't do that, they gave them five contiguous patients in five beds with <clears throat> differential workloads. The nurses often reported that the increased communication with the physician outweighed 
the detriment of having to do more total care. And so they proposed a model where maybe we should stop thinking about balancing the workload and spend more time thinking about balancing the teams. Our goal is to get the bedside nurse involved in structured interdisciplinary rounds, which is the new name for DCAM, more on that soon. And so hopefully that will become a next step here at Barnes. Having case management and social work integrated at the bedside is aspirational, but it could be a future direction. Some of these studies had geographic PTOT. I actually don't quite understand how they work here, but could that be a possibility here? We'll find out. Including nutrition and pharmacy more, not just in uh, ward rounding, but also in the um, structured interdisciplinary rounds may be beneficial. And then in general, this new project will provide a platform to do more research projects going forward. So here are all the references I used uh, in making this talk. And as always, I'd like to give a thank you to Dr. Frazier uh, for supporting Grand Rounds and giving us the opportunity to present this. Dr. Costco for mentoring us of the year. Dr. Forger for allowing me to abandon the clinic temporarily to work on this project. <laughs> the chief squad, who's my rock. House staff um, for inspiring us to continue doing this important work. The geography team, which was primarily composed on the physician side of Dr. Shashelsky, Kali, Morgan, and Auberly. The nursing staff was represented by Beth Cotton, Gina Pace, and Hillary Harris. Aaron English from Case Management, Kelly Zenner from Social Work, Dr. Fondin, who great, uh, graciously gave us those call rooms on 14, which will allow us to expand our workspace and agreed to give us a budget to do that work. And then Dr. Williams, who brought these insights and hopefully some energy get behind getting this project done. All right. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Siri, for the introduction, and thank you to Devin for your talk this morning. Um, I'm John Hickman. It's a real pleasure to join you from this side of Grand Rounds. Um, I want to thank all the house staff and faculty for being here in person and virtually everybody that's there. Um, you know, your attendance at Grand Rounds this year has been really special and appreciated for it. To uh, echo Mohit from last week, it's been an absolute pleasure to be a chief resident this year. And I want to thank you all for the opportunity to join you this morning. Um, this morning, I'm going to talk a little bit about exploring the historical and modern relationship between theater and medicine and to share some insights from my prior career on how this relationship maybe can benefit our patients and maybe uh, benefit ourselves as well. Again, I have no financial disclosures. I need to start with a bit of a disclaimer here, though. <laughs> Uh, as uh, Siri sort of hinted at, I had a bit of a circuitous path into medicine and uh, began my career in the theater. I attended Northwestern University for undergrad, where I pursued a degree in theater with a certificate in musical theater. While my peers were studying organic chemistry, I was quite literally pretending to be a panther. <laughs> really wish that was a joke. Uh, at Northwestern, I performed in well over 40 stage productions, everything from Candide and Once Upon a Mattress, pictured here, to Caspar, where I portrayed a feral child in the vein of Tabula Rasa, where I had to memorize 80 pages of nonsense words. I continued to work professionally after graduation. Proud to say I never had to wait a table. I appeared locally, such as this production of the world premiere of the musical rendition of The Three Musketeers at Chicago Shakespeare and Navy Pier, pictured here with Jessie Mueller next to me, uh, long before she won her Tony Award for Beautiful, the Carol King musical, to regional productions, seen here in Guys and Dolls. For obvious reasons, totally unrelated, I was excited when we removed the roast section from CPC. <laughs> Uh, most notably, I performed at the second national tour and Broadway companies of the musical Jersey Boys, which afforded me some unique opportunities from cutting the world's largest cheesecake <laughs> to performing at the 2007 Emmy Awards. That is me there pretending to play a ridiculously large saxophone <laughs> while shaking my backside at the cast of The Office. <laughs> Eventually, I transitioned into medicine after a post-baccalaureate pre-med program. Now, the why of which could probably be a talk in its own right, but as you can imagine, when it came time to apply to residency, I could essentially write the script of my interviews. Well, that's a unique background. Uh, why the switch? But when it came to applying for fellowship, however, I was asked a different question. Do you feel like your theater training had overlaps with medicine? What connections did you see between your prior career and this one? 
And these questions caused me to reflect and drove my inspiration for today's talk. And to help answer them, and largely because I just find medical history fascinating, it helps to go back in time and look at the long connection between theater and medicine. I feel like I need to put another slight disclaimer here that I am definitely not a historian, so please don't ask me too many questions about that, but I found some of these details interesting and, I don't know, perhaps relevant. Now, the application of healing roots, herbs, clay, and poultices is likely as old as humans. Over time, the role of healer was often taken by, you could argue, performers, such as shaman, priests, witch doctors, or sorcerers. Most would link common maladies to religious or spiritual affliction. Healing rituals were very often accompanied by dance, incantations, and ceremonial performance with the hopes to relieve these afflictions and to frighten or expunge troublesome spirits. Skipping over thousands of years of Babylonian, Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Indian, and Asian history, the birth of modern, and I will almost exclusively be discussing Western theater, is usually ascribed to the Greeks. While considered some of the most prolific inventors of any time, Grecians codified, documented, and explored numerous cultural aspects, many of which were appropriated from other cultures. But the argument can be made that theater and medicine, with apologies to democracy, were two of the greatest gifts from which we benefit today. You can see the importance the Greeks ascribed to theater in their architecture, as seen here at the theater at Epidaurus. Acknowledging the inherent sexism in history, one of the fathers of Greek theater, along with Aeschylus, Euripides, and Sophocles, was Aristotle. From what we know of Aristotle and poetics, the purpose of drama or tragedy, as it was described, is to arouse feelings of pity and fear in the audience, thereby to purge them, making them stronger emotionally. Much like healers of the past, the role of the actor or the tragedian was to expunge troublesome feelings or afflictions. In this way, the performance and spectacle of theater had in itself a healing purpose. Now, while not a true contemporary of Aristotle, they likely only overlapped by 14 years or so, Hippocrates, the arguable father, again, of modern Western medicine, really used the same language of the theater in describing medicine. As one famous Hippocratic author noted in Breaths, chapter one, the doctor sees terrible sights, while the tragedian displays terrible sights. In this way, as historian Jacques Joanna notes, it is the spectacle of human suffering that unites medical writers and tragedians in ancient Greece. Now, the spectacle or performance of human suffering was truly, let's call it celebrated, as it were, starting around 1493 with the advent of the anatomical dissecting theater. Here, bodies would be publicly dissected to a remarkably enthusiastic audience. As an Italian physician, Alexander Benedetti wrote, there must be guards to restrain the eager public as it enters, and two people should stand at the door to take entry fees. The outstanding personalities and authorities of the town were invited to be present. These were true theatrical productions. As this article from the Smithsonian writes, picture it, a rapt audience serenaded by a group of musicians leans forward to see the performance. Only the actors are doctors and the scenery is a chorus. Seen here is Guillaume Rondelet, who famously described nearly 250 examples of marine animals, hence the fish. Also famously established the dissecting theater of Montpellier, France in the early 1500s, and infamously dissected his own infant who had died during childbirth. Now the surgical theater evolved directly from these anatomical theaters. As the historian Richard Barnett notes, Hieronymus Fabricius, who lived in the mid 1500s, and is considered, again, the father of embryology, he would have felt totally comfortable in 1840s surgical spaces. Many surgeons embraced the theater of their operations. Notoriously, Scottish surgeon Robert Liston would enter the surgical theater saying, time me, gentlemen, time me, with the prevailing thought that surgeries performed more quickly had better outcomes. Liston notoriously performed some amputations from removal to suture in two and a half minutes. 
In one such amputation, he was moving so quickly, he severed the patient's testicles as well as the limb. In another, he was going so fast that he severed his assistant's finger, the patient's limb, and stabbed the coat of an onlooker who reported to be so convinced that he had been mortally wounded, he died on the spot of heart failure. As both the uh, patient and assistant both died of gangrene, uh, it's said to be the first surgical procedure with 300% mortality. <laughs> um, fortunately, or unfortunately, uh, germ theory took hold and anesthesia became more widely used. Audiences were more and more removed from the process and the spectacle diminished. The design of anatomical spaces and their contemporaneous theatrical counterparts as seen here with Shakespeare's globe are remarkably similar and for good reason. They share common ancestry with Grecian and Roman design. While the drama and spectacle of surgery was quite the draw, it was not only surgeons who embraced the theater. This slide comes from our very own CPC deck of Dr. George Dock, a protege of Osler, with a similar approach to teaching medicine. I'm told that the subject in the center photo was a medical student at the time, and the origins of the design elements of our instructional spaces should be easy to trace as well. Medicine has featured prominently in film and television as long as the medium has existed, from 1909's The Country Doctor to Crisis with Cary Grant, who gave us our modern notion of the neurosurgeon, note the aseptic technique. <laughs> to the great Akira Kurosawa with red beard, to the sexually inappropriate mash of the 70s in response to the Vietnam War, to everything from ER, the Nick, Scrubs, House, the Resident, and whatever in God's name they're doing on TLC. <laughs> the drama <laughs> of medicine always has and continues to be a draw. As we look at how elements of theater and performance are present in quote unquote modern medicine, there is often a resistance feeling that discussing performance in medicine is inherently disingenuous and must therefore be divested from science. I would argue that acting in its best and truest form is about being present. No one wants to watch a human emote on stage. What we long to see is a person like us, struggling either tragically or hilariously with uh, life. Now, this only comes about when an actor, and I use that term in the gender neutral sense, reacts and responds honestly to others, divesting from themselves and placing the focus on their scene partner or situation. In this way, acting is not false, but rather true reactions and emotions to scripted or unscripted in the case of improv situations. While the stakes of a theatrical performance and a medical encounter can be quite different, the emotional and human connections between humans is not. Separating theater and medicine is in many ways a fool's errand as the tenets of performance are deeply incorporated of all elements and training of our work. Think about the basics of putting on a scene and their correlates. In our work as healers, we don a uniform or costume we're particular about the tools of our trade. We embrace illness scripts and are careful in our evolving dialogue, our lines have changed. We no longer ask men, women, or both, but what gender or sexual partner do you prefer? The concept of roles is deeply embedded in what we do. Those of the doctor, nurse, caretaker, healers, their counterparts, the patient or sick role. Quite often, particularly early in our training, we're asked to step into these roles and uncomfortable scenes long before we feel the competence and confidence to do so. To help us deal with these dramatic scenarios and high stakes emotions, we use scripted scenes to rehearse real emergencies and issues. At this point, well over 90% of training programs have simulation centers. Here we use set scenes and scripts to rehearse. We practice such that we improve not only our clinical and procedural skills, but we've also seen benefits in teamwork and communication. We hire professional actors to improvise difficult conversations and rehearse communicating bad news. We ask trainees to recognize emotion, invest in their scene partner, and be flexible in their dialogue. Improvisation is pervasive in what we do, and some practitioners are embracing that directly. Following his time in MASH, 
Alan Alda hosted the PBS show Scientific American Frontiers, where he used his own training in improvisational theater to help scientists convey their work and studies more effectively. He then went on to work with Stony Brook University to open the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science to use the tenets of improvisation to help scientists, physicians, and researchers communicate better with their patients and audiences. In essence, his work, and all improv for that matter, tries to avoid bringing your round peg to a square hole. Broadly speaking, it uses the yes and approach to build on information that is presented and expand a line of thinking. This technique is very valuable in improving communication in general. In fact, there was a great grand rounds a few years ago that I encourage you to look up if you missed it on the benefits of improv training and its connection to medicine. The question that arises then, is there any benefit to this connection between theater and medicine? And while this work is developing, anecdotally, I can personally attest that there is. The notion of empathy is complicated, but I like this definition. A cognitive attribute that involves an ability to understand the patient's inner experiences and perspective and a capability to communicate this understanding. In this way, empathy is both passive or effective and active or cognitive. Theater, improvisation, trains your empathetic imagination to place oneself as if you are in the position of the other, in this case, your patient, to take the focus away from you and honestly invest in another. The physician and all healers do see terrible sights, but developing empathy may lead to improved patient satisfaction, greater adherence to therapy, better clinical outcomes, lower malpractice liability, and likely I would add better communication. This becomes more and more important as payment models are increasingly based on patients' experience of their care and how providers communicate that information, seen here in this information taken directly from CMS. It stands to reason that if we improve as communicators, empathetic listeners, there may actually be financial implications. But beyond just helping patients, embracing theater and medicine may help us. Medical students training in improv noted improved proactivity, well-being, engagement, and communication. The more fully we can, again, divest from ourselves in this process and put our focus on our patients, we may provide better care and feel better about helping others. All an important part of finding meaning of work here at the center, a core value as noted by Tate Shanefelt in addressing rampant physician burnout. Theater and medicine have been intertwined as long as both have existed. Medicine is filled with drama and tragedy. The skills developed in theatrical training may be able to assist us in being more empathetic communicators with our patients and to more easily place ourselves in their shoes. Now, am I saying that we should be recruiting more acting students for our medical programs? No, maybe not exactly. But perhaps in embracing theater training more directly in the training of our medical students and in faculty development, we could purge these strong emotions, improve empathy, and reach catharsis to which Aristotle described. With that, I want to extend several thank yous. Thank you to Dr. Frazier, Drs. Costco and Spencer. Thank you to my co-chiefs and to our amazing house staff. I want to add a special thank you to Jen Bogovich and Mark Bahala and the IT department for all their help this year. I'll wave to you in the back. I thank you to you all for allowing me to join you today. With that, one last awkward photo. <laughs> and we'll throw it to the QR code and uh, time for questions. Siri, you uh, have a mic. You want to see if there's anything in the chat for us? In the chat, I have a question. Fire away. Will you ever return to the stage? Will I ever retire from the stage? Is that return, the question? Return to the, stage. Return to the stage. You're on it right now. I'm on it right now. <laughs> um, I hope so. Uh, uh, when there's time. Yeah. I um I do think it's really important and I really I do miss it. I miss that part of it. I miss uh being involved in actual performance more directly. So I don't know, maybe at some point down the line, I'll join community theater or something like that. Scratch that itch. Any other questions from here? Yeah, Dr. Frazier. Thank you both so much for those terrific talks. So I have a question for each of you, but I'll start with Devin 
Um, then what do you think is the opportunity for optimizing interdisciplinary education along with the uh, geographic localization? So do you see any role potentially for physicians, nurses, PTOT training together more effectively? Yes. Um, it's difficult to say where it could go. It is worth noting, similar to John's presentation, that our Sim Center does now incorporate um, nurses into the into the acute care response simulations. So I think we're working with them there. I think when we move towards a better interdisciplinary rounds, we will get more insight into what they're doing. But there have been many ideas floating around by email about whether we should have people shadow a nurse or shadow a physical therapist for a day, get a sense of what they do and how they add to the team. Um, I have no plans for those things right now, but um, I'm sure that the new chief class and Dr. Shashelsky will certainly continue growing on this model. And John, what's the opportunity for um, developing either improv or uh, public speaking training for medical students and, and residents that might help advance their medical careers? You know, and, and take advantage of the, the acting background that you have so admirably displayed for us. <laughs> There are, I think there are a lot of opportunities for it. Um, I mean, there's some folks that incorporate it now, right? Uh, maybe it's small workshops here and there. And I've, you know, when I was in med school, we did, I was starting some of that and doing a few classes with um, some of our medical trainees at that time. But I would also encourage us not to think of it just in terms of something as benefit for medical students and trainees, but also for faculty development, because a lot of these things, people get very nervous thinking about doing it or, or engaging in it, thinking, oh, I'm not funny, right? You know, it, but it's not ever about being funny at all. It's about responding, you know, honestly and accurately in the moment to whatever's happening. That often ends up being funny, but it's not an intention. But I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to include that. Maybe that's in workshop formats, but I think some kind of longitudinal curriculum is really a benefit because it's it helps us uh, relieve stress it helps us communicate better. It helps us uh, get perspective, I think, which I think is really important for all levels of our training in our career. Thank you. My pleasure. I got questions for both of you. All right. How could you possibly have a question for me? <laughs> <laughs> We have med students and trainees being the physician. Do you think there's any value in having them also play the role of the patient? I think absolutely. Um, you know, that. I can ask a lot more of them, I think, from a performance standpoint, it could be a little stressful. But I think you're right, it's important to be able to put yourself in that situation, maybe even directly, like you're saying, you know, one thing that people are exploring is using illness scripts, right, uh, trying to really approach diagnostic reasoning early on from what does it look like really when it walks in the door? And there's no better way to do that, I think, than trying to imagine yourself or even physically performing that, playing that in that role. You know, where is the pain? What does it feel like? Where does it move, right? If you can start putting yourself into that role and then maybe physically sitting across from your physician, you can get an experience of what, what works, what doesn't work, right? When someone asks you about or you know, gives you bad news, or asks you how you're feeling, or what you know, what's going on at home. Um, it, it's, I think, it's gonna be really eye-opening for people when they're in that position, in that hot seat, as it were, and saying, you know, seeing what works and doesn't work. Yes. My friends in geolocalization. <laughs> um, I feel like with geolocalization, there's a lot of opportunity for QI projects because you kind of have these little environments. Um, did any of your research uh, show any improvement on QI in these environments and helping them to help with burnout as physicians feel like they're seeing change from things that they've noticed? Does that make sense? So there were some papers that looked at like reported satisfaction in things. And in general, both nurses and physicians reported improved satisfaction when wards were localized compared to previous. But in terms of um, like measuring burnout, I didn't come across any studies. I was also trying to keep it narrow and focused though. So that doesn't say there isn't data out there. Uh, in terms of QI work, I think um, 
there's a ton of opportunity. And I think what's interesting about our firm's structure is that uh, we could implement QI projects in only one firm and then monitor like a case control between Med1 and Med2, for example, and C. So I think that is a, a great platform for opportunity going forward. Thank you so much both for sharing your work. Um, I think I have a comment for John and question for <laughs> um, While you were presenting, I was actually wondering if um, some of the, those uh, theatrical uh, tools or, or experience could be used to train faculty when it comes to providing feedback. Because uh, we always think of trainees and going through simulation um, cases, but I think we may use those skills again to, to help faculty uh, provide meaningful feedback to trainees. Perfect. <laughs> that was easy enough. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for your work. I know um, I don't think I've personally given you enough credit for all of the work that you did this year. So we're taking this chance to really give you a lot of credit for everything that will be happening next week we are really excited about going through 50 floors for rounds um what do you think or what are you the most excited about when it comes to shaping to geo organization um <clears throat> I think there's a couple of answers to that. Honestly, like the workspace on 14 is the most exciting part of it for me, just because workspace has been such a pain point for our program for the year. Um, I think in terms of like structurally what, what it will do, um, not everyone who's in our residency is old enough to remember doing Onc Firm or Moonlighting on BNT for that matter. But back in the day, four years ago, when that was a thing, <laughs> um, one of the, my favorite parts about Onc Firm was that the patient stayed forever. Not that, that, not that I didn't like discharging and admitting, but just that you got to know them really well. And rounds were quick because they're there for like two week course of whatever. And so you're like, labs look good, moving on to the next. You could get through rounds quickly, get all the work done. And at the end of the day, I would go back and I would talk to multiple of them and just like get to know them. Now I have a couple of people I remember and will for the rest of my life um, who I just made social calls on. And I hope that with decreasing the team caps and increasing the efficiency, it'll open up the opportunity for the residents to invest in patients like that again. You guys aren't gonna get away without questions from me. Uh, <laughs> so, thank you both. Uh, John, bring back the mustache. Um, um, we'll see you back. <laughs> so I'll start with Devin. Um, it seems like from your talk, one of the major emphasis points is that this will bring back a lot of satisfaction both from the physicians, but also from the nurses um, and that intercommunication and interrelationship that we have. Um, but it also seems that nurses, as far as I can tell, for the longest time have been geolocalized within our own health system and other health systems. So why is it that from the physician point of view, we're somewhat catching up now? Because a lot of the papers that you reference, including papers from Dr. Mark Williams, and his colleagues, they implemented these strategies in the early 2000s or even in 2010. So why that gap? So you're asking why are we behind? Yeah, compared okay. to say nurses who seem to have been geolocalized for as long as I can. Well, So even in our system and others, the nurses are always unit-based. And so their frustration or the pain they experience um, seems to be that when they are carrying five patients and they have five different positions they have to talk to, it just takes them forever to even get the communication. Imagine making five phone calls at the end of rounds every day or, you know, whatever. It's just, um, whereas you could call one person and be like, I have three questions for you, answer them now. I think the nursing structure largely is similar across systems. Why we're moving to geographic localization now is a complex question that I will leave to others who've been here longer, but our hospital run by two organizations that has like seven buildings is a behemoth and it is not always easy to implement um, those sorts of structural changes. And, and I take no credit for being the person who made this happen, only that I was at the right place at the right time to help make it move. Um, I think what I was alluding to at the end of my talk though about nurses localizing like five beds in a row is the next step in like the future of microclimate. Cause if you can really the most interesting paper I read was about nurse pods where there would be one attending for every 10 patients and each nurse had five, 
contiguous rooms in the entire team with two nurses and one doctor and that like optimize the efficiency. So I'm hopeful that one day, whether it's on the hospital side or the teaching service side, that might be possible here. That was a great answer, Devin. I will add that uh, I think right now represents a confluence of right time um, and uh, lots of different factors coming together to do this. So um, I think it's a, a great opportunity um, to reimagine the, the way we provide uh, care on the inpatient services. So it's the right time, right place for a lot of us. Last one. <laughs> so kind of piggybacking what um, Christine had mentioned about empathy and performance. So I think we all can remember when we were medical students doing simulations and kind of being taught to be that performative actor of showing empathy using some buzzwords for it. What happens to bridge that performative act into a more genuine empathy and becoming a true empath when it comes to going in real life, being a trainee, being an attending? I think it, well, one involves experience, right? Being, being in the situations that you were rehearsing or you know, pretending as it were to be in. But I think a lot of it comes from really investing in that work. Um, I think one of the risks, like Christine was saying, maybe about having students play the role of patients as well, you know, we have to take it seriously for it really to, to make a difference. It, it can be a lot of fun, right? And it can be play. But the more you take a simulation seriously, the more you actually invest in a standardized patient encounter, the more you treat it like it's the real thing, I think the more it becomes real for you. And then when you're doing the real thing, you know, you've got some tools in your toolbox to help you with that. Um, and, you know, your thought doesn't become necessarily, oh, here, here's what I have to say. Here's, what, here's the empathetic things I have to put on this situation. It's more just, I've got these things in my, I've done this before. I've seen this before. Let's see how this plays out. Let's listen to this person, this family this patient, whoever it is, using these tools at my discretion to try to help them. And I think that can be powerful for folks. All right. I think that's it. Great. Well, thank you all again. Please join us next week for the last grand rounds with Dr. Siri Ancha and Dr. Christine Auberly. Thanks, Mark.